Greetings, I'm Dr. LaPrincess Brewer, Cardiology Fellow at Mayo Clinic. Today on theheart.org, we will be discussing the role of 3D printing in congenital heart disease. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Thomas Foley, Assistant Professor of Radiology who specializes in multimodality imaging. Welcome, Dr. Foley. Thank you. 3D printing is a compelling new technology that has the potential to revolutionize cardiac interventions. We are eager to hear how this new innovative technology will enhance our knowledge and understanding of structural heart disease. So to start, what is 3D printing? 3D printing, um, which also goes by the names of additive manufacturing and rat rapid prototyping, is a technology that uses um, what a machine called a 3D printer to build three-dimensional models um, one layer at a time, so it lays down one thin layer of material, it bonds it together with another thin layer of material, and over time it builds a model up from the bottom. Um, and it bases this on a computer-aided um, design model, mm -hmm. so the model is made in a computer program, sent to the printer, and then the, the printer prints it over time. There are several different technologies for doing this. Um, the models that we have here were made on a printer that uses a liquid resin that is solidified when uh, exposed to a UV light of a certain frequency. Okay. And then it's uh, bonded together at the same time. Other printers use powders such as gypsum powder, which can be glued together with a super glue-like material. Uh, there are printers that print with metal that is uh, melted together with a laser. Other printers use a plastic, which is melted together with heat. Um, mm. Some printers even use uh, things such as chocolate to print, so you can have edible prints. Okay, so what is the process for creating a 3D model of the heart or valves? So to create a model of the heart or any um, body part, you need to start with an imaging uh, modality. Um, in, in most cases, this is either CT or MRI. So a patient has a CT of the heart in this case, um, and what we need is a volumetric data set. So a uh, data set that has a whole stack of images that can be put together um, without any gaps in the anatomy. And then after that is acquired, um, somebody segments the anatomy or they go through and select what they want to print. Um, and that process can take anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours to get all the anatomy that's needed. Once that anatomy has been segmented out of the, uh, an of the images, it's sent to another program where it's processed. And in this uh, step, things such as um, any noise that was in the model would be smoothed out. If the model is supposed to be hollow, such as this model, we can hollow them out. Um, if you want to make a cut, such as this cut point here, so you can see inside the model, that is done at that time. Um, and if you have a model where parts are not physically connected, such as this model, you can place pegs to connect them so that it, the model doesn't fall apart. Okay, so it truly gives you that spatial relationship to allow you that tangible manipulation of the cardiac structures. Yeah, and then once that portion is done, you bring it back into the overlaid onto the images that were initially acquired so you can verify that what's in the model is actually corresponds to the actual patient's anatomy. And then after that, you send it to the printer and it prints. And our printer would take anywhere from four hours to print a small model like this up to 12 hours to print a larger heart model. Um, some other net anatomic models have taken several days to print. Excellent. This is very, very interesting. And have there been any studies comparing 3D models to more traditional um, cardiovascular imaging techniques? Uh, there have been a few or several case reports of individual cases or some small case series that have looked at this, but those are mostly anecdotal. They usually report what a single surgeon's experience has been. Um, they usually say that it helps improve the uh, safety of the technique or reduce okay. the time, but there have been no controlled trials looking at outcomes, see if there's improved outcomes with when 3D printing is used or any uh, studies that have proven that there's a cost savings to this. But okay. despite that, we still think it's a good technique. Um, it, the studies will come, I think, in time as there's some planned. But if a surgeon tells us this is beneficial for them and it makes them feel more confident in the surgery, surgery we'll make them the model. 
Uh, it's also helpful for patients, um, both when you're doing it in informed consent so that they can mm, better sure. understand the surgical procedure, and they just like to know um, a little bit more how the surgery is going to work. So we found that patients really like this too. Okay. So you just touched on a little bit about the cost savings. So are there any cost savings in using 3D models, and is it, is it covered by insurance at all? So as I said previously, it's um, not in any control studies that have shown that, but we think that there probably is, just because the cost of operating time and anesthesia time is so high, even a small cost savings from a surgeon knowing the anatomy before entering the chest um, would uh, pay for the models right there. Okay. Um, so, no, there's, to answer your question, there's no studies that have shown that, but we think that there will be. Okay. Um, and also, if they improve any outcomes, um, safety, prevent any complications, that'll cover the cost of a model, too. Okay. Um, and to answer the second part of the question, right now, because there are no studies that show uh, any cost savings or improved outcomes, insurance companies and Medicare do not cover the cost of the models. Most of our models are done um, under development funds. Um, some places the surgeons will pay for them out of the operating costs. Okay. And what is the future of 3D printing? What do you foresee? I think that there's a very vast future for this technology. Um, I think in the near term, the main uses of this will still be for surgical planning, um, such as what we do here. Um, like this model was used, um, this is a patient that had a ventricular septal defect, six-year-old, uh, that had a ventricular septal defect and pulmonary atresia and had multiple collateral arteries coming off the aorta and going to the lungs. And this was used to uh, determine where the collaterals were because some of these had to be reconnected to the main pulmonary artery. Some of them had to be ligated. And the surgeon felt that this was very helpful in planning the procedure and knowing exactly what he needed to do. Okay. Um, so I think for surgery, um, should surgical planning be one of the main things in the near future. Another thing that is being done some now is planning interventional procedures such as placing percutaneous um, valves. Mm -hmm. We've done a few cases of that here where they actually test deploy a valve on the bench top to see how it'll fit to see if they think the, that procedure would be successful. Excellent. Moving beyond that, I think that we'll start to print um, things such as, or implantable devices such as um, cardiac valves that will be custom sized to the patient or conduits. And these have the potential to be printed with biologic material that could grow with the patient. So they, mm -hmm. you know, if you place this in a young child, they may not need another valve replacement or may prolong the time to needing another valve replacement. Um, and even beyond that, there are some uh, researchers that have said that they'll be able to 3D print a functional beating heart. So oh. that <laughs> is on the horizon. I don't think it'll happen anytime soon, but we may see it. Wow, so the opportunities seem limitless. So this seems, um, the access to this seems pretty limited. Um, what types of centers actually have 3D printing for patients and surgeons and cardiologists to take advantage of? So I know of several centers in the congenital heart disease world that do this. We do this. Um, Several universities do this, such as uh, Arizona State, in partnership with Phoenix Children's Hospital, does this. The University of Toronto has a large program for 3D printing, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I know there are others that I'm forgetting. Um, there are several centers in Europe that do this and in Asia. Um, but even some smaller centers um, are doing this. And then even if you don't have a 3D printer, there are several companies that will make the models for you where you can send them the data, tell them what you want, they'll make the model and then um, if you're a surgeon they'll send you the preliminary digital model to see if it's including all the anatomy um, that you want and then they'll print it. Or there are uh, companies that will just do the printing so you can actually make the model yourself um, in the computer and then send it just to be printed somewhere else. So. There is um, several centers around the world that are doing it in-house, but there are also other options for doing it to contract it out to other um, businesses. Okay, this is wonderful. So thanks, Dr. Foley, for these very great insights on this innovative tool that will be used to enhance patient-centered care. And thanks to our viewers. We hope you will continue to check out future content on Mayo Clinic's page at theheart.org on Medscape Cardiology.